Welcome. There was a growing consensus among scholars of international affairs that the future of the world would be Asian. The view that a new global order was being written for the 21st century, which would see the baton of civilizational leadership pass from a Western global rules-based order to an Asia-led community of common identity. Central to this idea of a world which is led by Asia is a sense of partnership in the Asia-Pacific region. The recent military confrontation between India and China and China's continuing muscle flexing in the South China Sea threatens the very idea of a shared Asian future. China is simultaneously threatening the sovereignty of countries like Vietnam, Japan, Philippines and India. The belligerence being displayed by Beijing raises the question, can an Asia that is not at peace with itself really lead the rest of the world? If fissures in the Asia-Pacific region continue to deepen, then not just will Asia be divided economically, but nations in the continent will be at war. Is this just a temporary rupture linked to the pandemic or is a new fault line emerging that is unlikely to go away? To discuss the fissures and frictions being seen in Asia and the impact this confrontation will have on the rest of the world, I am joined on India Today's news track by best-selling author of the book The Future is Asian, strategic affairs expert and renowned futurologist Parag Khanna. Parag, welcome and thank you so much for taking our time to join us on the India Today news track. You're a very avid watcher of uh, Chinese and East Asian politics. In the midst of a global pandemic when the world's economy is in recession and there's so much turmoil, China is flexing its muscles in the Himalayas and in the South China Sea. What in your view, sitting where you are in Singapore, is driving Chinese aggression at a time when there's so much turmoil already? Rahul, thank you. Let me first, please, if I may, dispense with the straw man uh, in the room. You and I both know that there are scholars who will confuse the Asian-led world order with peace among Asians. And those are two different things. And this is not something that any serious scholar would actually assert. Tell me, was the 20th century European world order peaceful? Was the 20th century Pax Americana peaceful? Of course not. Europe only actually became at peace with itself in the last 75 years. So let's not confuse these things. And I know that you're not, but this is something that's out there. We need to get this right. The world can be led by Asian powers and Asia be the center of geopolitical gravity without Asia necessarily being at peace. It would be wonderful if Asian powers were at peace with each other, but that doesn't mean that Asians cannot be the leading powers. Now, Asia is becoming a regional system, meaning an intense set of relationships in which the trade, investment, diplomacy, and friction and tension that you alluded to is higher than with other parts of the world. So there's an intensity now within Asia, and Asian powers, as they rise, are settling the disputes among them, sometimes peacefully, sometimes violently. But they remain, nonetheless, a highly powerful collective system and they still have very intense complementarities among them. There's never going to be an Asian Union, the likes of the European Union. So the stakes in how Asian powers relate to each other are very, very high. So let's turn to your question to be clear. China has been flexing its muscle in the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, for about 20 plus years. In the East China Sea with respect to the Senkaku Islands for a decade or more. And of course, in the Himalayas, since the late 1950s and certainly the 1960s. So is this a part of Xi Jinping's nationalism, as well as taking advantage of others' weakness in light of the pandemic and the economic recession? The answer is both. Now, China, let's remember, is portraying this incident as a response to India's unilateral building of uh, roads and other infrastructure in Ladakh. But of course, China, has been a significant abuser of this infrastructure as a fait accompli strategy in dictating boundaries for much, much longer. So there's been a lot of talk 
about uh, President Xi Jinping being under pressure domestically in China when the economy has taken a downward turn. Uh, the external adventurism, it is being suggested by many international scholars, is a bit to deflect atten uh, attention from internal troubles. What's your reading of the current domestic situation in China? I'll be honest with you, I disagree with that proposition. I don't think that that is correct. Because as you know, India is far more obsessed with China than the reverse. And that's a mere fact of the power dynamics among them. Let's look at the facts. Life in China has returned to normal more so than in just about every other country. Though indeed, of course, they are struggling in their own ways with higher unemployment and economic pressures. But if you notice how little the Chinese media is talking about this dispute in their public domestic messaging, clearly they're not deflecting uh, the current troubles that they have onto India because they're not really talking about India that much. In China, tr traditionally, and in certainly in recent decades, when there are domestic challenges, they are met with domestic efforts and domestic communication, not necessarily by international sca scapegoating. Uh, the Indian Prime Minister was in Leh and when he was there he spoke about the era of expansionism having ended and about how every expansionist power either ended up on the losing side or had to change course. Would you share that view that the era of expansionism is over or do you think that China actually believes that it's built enough economic and military muscle to be able to achieve its national objectives through a new era of new expansionism? I think historically and philosophically he's correct, but we have to further analyze how China pursues expansionism. China is what I call a supply chain empire. It's actually much more like the Dutch empire of the 16th uh, and early 17th centuries than it is like uh, the British empire. Because the British empire, of course, sought direct territorial control and administrative sovereignty over its various dominions. The Chinese are much more interested in supply chains and infrastructure. They're interested in ports and railways and resources. They're not actually trying to govern the domestic politics of foreign countries. So we should remember that China can be globally expansionist economically in terms of its neo-mercantile policies, while also in terms of territorial expansionism being largely focused on these very, very localized disputes, which it hopes, of course, to turn in its favor. There are seven or eight such outstanding disputes, the dispute with India being one or two of them, uh, and it's hoping to fix those. I think it knows that it cannot peacefully and perhaps not even successfully subdue or absorb an entire neighboring civilization like a Japan or uh, Korea and certainly not India. But there's a big difference between the kind of countervailing coalitions that are being formed now and what we saw during the Cold War, where there were two very distinct blocks, the NATO bloc and the Eastern bloc. And the difference was that there was very little economic interdependency. Now, whether it is an Australia or a Japan or an India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, there's a huge amount of economic interdependency. So how does that then shape uh, the countervailing coalitions which are being formed to militarily defend uh, the national sovereignty of each of these countries? Well, the Cold War is, in fact, not a good analogy for what's happening in Asia because of the fact that, again, Asian powers, having lived through the Cold War, and many Asian nations, such as India, having experienced col colonialism, do not want to live in a world where it's us versus them, where they have to choose sides. Because, of course, many people in India alive today remember colonialism, remember the Cold War, remember either non-alignment or being a, a, a subject, a colonial subject. So today what's different is that all countries, big or small, are practicing what I call multi-alignment. They want to have good relations with the United States, with Russia, with Europe, with China, with Japan, with as many powers as possible. They want to have the economic complementarity still with China, but also manage the territorial relations and geopolitical tensions with China, because of course, China is everyone's neighbor here in Asia. So yes, balancing that uh, is uh, trickier, you might say, than the all or nothing, us or them proposition of the Cold War. However, there is no doubt 
that having a strategy of multi-alignment is actually the pathway to resilience. It is the way in which countries that are too dependent on China reach out and create those new relationships in terms of whom they sell their commodities to, who they partner with to, uh, to procure and to produce sensitive technologies and medical equipment and so forth. And that's why the D10 effort that the, that the UK has been talking about and the expansion of the G7 to the G11 or 10 or 11 as the US administration has proposed, these are all examples of this multi-alignment, new coalitions for different purposes. It could be for technology like 5G or medical equipment. It could be military for patrolling the Indo-Pacific waters. And it could be for infrastructure. Think of all of the initiatives that are now competing with Belt and Road that did not exist, Rahul, even three years ago. Europe has the Asia Connectivity Initiative. America has the Blue Dot Network. Japan and India have talked about connectivity corridors. Everyone now has their own version of Belt and Road in order to compete with Belt and Road. So we're creating a marketplace diplomatically, strategically, economically, commercially, and that's a good thing. It gives all of the countries of Asia and beyond a choice as to who they do business with. And if they do less with China, then that might be better for them in the long term. But they have the rest of the world. How do you assess India's options economically, militarily, diplomatically vis-a-vis -vis China in the wake of this massive build-up along the line of actual control? And how do you see the India-China confrontation play itself out over the next few weeks and months? Well, let's take the second part first. In the short term, I think this might be another example similar to, uh, to Doklam, where China perhaps underestimates India's resolve. And therefore, there is uh, an opportunity to, uh, as we've seen most recently in the high-level uh, military dialogues, for both sides to step back a little bit. What might be a smart strategy uh, for India is to now, not necessarily unilaterally, but given that there has been such little willingness on the Chinese side to talk about actual border settlement, this is an important opportunity for India to effectively uh, suggest or to uh, propose the, the, the formal demarcation of the boundaries, to actually settle the dispute. Because once again, India has reminded China that these disputes are not going to be settled in the long term in its favor. And I think that's critical momentum that India now has. Then the longer term issues are also going to play out. How do you extricate China from the technology ecosystem, limit Chinese ownership of, uh, of uh, financial and other technological and, and industrial assets in India and so forth? Now, here, it's, India is in actually a fortunate position. It may not have built every possible app or game to immediately replace China, but India is one of those countries that effectively get, can build a full stack. Uh, technologically, like China itself, like Japan, Korea, America. And I think that obviously plays very strongly to India's favor. India can have confidence that it can achieve that degree of uh, substitution. So I think that's very important on the economic side. And then, of course, continue with the coalitions diplomatically to ensure that this is viewed as part of a broader uh, priority, geopolitical and diplomatic priority, to ensure that China is uh, that we settle as many of these outstanding disputes as possible so that none of them can flare up, so that none of them can spill over, so that one tension that China may have uh, in the South China Sea doesn't somehow also lead to um, an initiation of a, another round of conflict with India. So I think all of India, India has to do all of these things. And I'm quite frankly glad to see that all of these ideas are now percolating in Delhi. How do you see this new tech Cold War shape up? The split between China and the rest of the world. Uh, China may, when it comes to artificial intelligence, machine learning, facial recognition, 5G have a technological edge. At this moment, the rest of the world, especially the US, trying to catch up. Who do you think five, ten years from now, what's your best bet? Who would have won this tech Cold War? How do you see it play out? So I want to be absolutely clear, Al, there is no new Cold War. There is no new Cold War between the U.S. and China on a global level in terms of the world being carved up into two rival camps. As I just said, multi-alignment is what every smart country is doing. They are not choosing sides. They are 
pursuing alliances or relationships of convenience in all directions and working with whomever they can, whenever they can. But as Indian leaders have also said, as a foreign secretary has said, we choose our own side. And that's what every smart country does. So let's not posit a new Cold War, a new Iron Curtain, because I don't know any countries lack, that are so lacking in sophistication and foresight that they would throw themselves wholeheartedly in one camp or the other. As you well know, the opinion of China is not exactly high right now anywhere in Asia, owing to uh, the concerns about its military aggression, its handling of the pandemic, and the tensions that we're seeing right now. The same is true, Rahul, in the technological domain. We cannot make these linear extrapolations where we say that simply because Huawei has an edge in 5G at the moment, because it has produced the equipment very rapidly and cheaply, and because it has a solid market share globally, that therefore 10 years from now the whole world will be using uh, Huawei 5G and China will be vacuuming up the world's uh, data and secrets. Because that's not how technology works. The law of diffusion of technology, it's very rapid spillover, including AI, 5G, and any other category of technology, spreads so much faster than any power can control. If that weren't true, Rahul, how did China become a technology superpower so quickly? If it were not the fact that technology spills across borders and can be stolen and bought so quickly. So when we think about even five years from now or 10 years from now, let's remember that India's AI companies are already out there uh, selling their services to the world with much less risk, of course, of your data being uh, being harvested and stolen. Let's remember that many countries in the world are now switching their 5G contracts to Nokia and Ericsson and other partners to uh, NTT Docomo of Japan already today, Rahul. So we have a marketplace of infrastructure, of telecommunications, of AI. There's no reason to believe that China was ever going to be globally dominant in these areas, it simply had first mover advantage in some markets. But that doesn't mean that the second mover and the third mover and the fourth mover don't come along and, uh, and rival that incumbent uh, for its leadership. And that is precisely what we're seeing happening right now. No, that's an interesting perspective that you have. China's. Uh military and government planners are usually supposed to be very adept at long-term strategic planning. One thing that most people who are watching you on this broadcast would not have understood is how does it suits, suit China's long-term interests to poison a relationship with 1.3 billion people? What are they even thinking? Well, Raul, the premise of your question is that China does in fact do long-term uh, you know, very complex grand strategy and therefore errors like this are somehow an exception to a rule where they've already mapped out action and reaction seven steps ahead. But quite frankly, that's not true. And therefore, a misstep like this shouldn't necessarily surprise us as much as it does. Um, as you know, I've been traveling around these along these new Silk Roads and new infrastructure projects of China's for about 20 years. And a lot of it is a reaction to the fact that because of globalization, they became the largest importer of commodities, the largest exporter of finished goods. They suddenly had, they had no choice but to develop these infrastructures and buy up these assets internationally just to preserve that uh, efficiency in their global uh, supply chains. So in a way, even Belt and Road, which people uh, are portray as a 50-year strategy and so forth, is very much a reactive one. Now, defense can become offense. And of course, China is using this leverage that it's built up, being the largest trading partner of 120 plus countries in the world to try and gain a foothold, to gain leverage, to gain influence. Of course, it is doing that as any power would and has done in history. But it's not the result of a deep and complex understanding of how the rest of the world works. Because when it comes to that, Rahul, China is as mistaken about this, uh, about these deeper issues as the United States has been in recent decades. And I've seen this very much firsthand. Again, the backlash against Belt and Road is a perfect example of this. Rahul, you'll appreciate this. When I go to Beijing, you know, very regularly, and I, and I lecture there and I speak to officials and academics and so forth, um, I, I explain to them, you know, what the mistakes have been made in Belt and Road. And the one thing that they are never quite able to do is to put themselves in the shoes 
of the countries where they are operating, whether it is East Africa, whether it is e even uh, countries like Pakistan, which they have such a close relationship with. And what they fail to understand time and time again is that these countries, as we were discussing earlier, are post-colonial countries that have been manipulated and dominated. They've been through the Cold War where they were exploited as well, and they don't want it to happen again. And China fails to do that mirror imaging, that empathetic kind of uh, thinking about what its partners actually want to get out of the relationship. And in failing to do that, they actually wind up making many of the same mistakes that we've seen other superpowers and great powers make in the past. You know, you're so close to Hong Kong, so I want to understand how you view the new security laws that have been brought by China in Hong Kong, which have really ended the one nation, two system uh, which, which existed so far. And how does this impact Hong Kong's position as the international gateway into the mainland? It, it is tragic. And in, as with many uh, tragedies, one might say it was also inevitable. Uh, we could have seen this coming perhaps even in 1997 at the time of the handover. Since that time, uh, China has uh, spared almost no expense or effort to accelerate the timeline of the full incorporation of Hong Kong. Even as rec as far back as 10 years ago, we were talking about um, you know the, the monetary sovereignty being uh, being reduced. Certainly, we saw this in uh, human rights and uh, you know freedom of speech and press and assembly and the ways in which the political assembly and, and governance was being manipulated. All of this has been going on for quite some time, and it is again it's tragic. There there is one. I, and I don't even want to call it a silver lining, but the only positive opportunity that anyone in Hong Kong can see right now is that by being part of this infrastructurally and commercially integrated Greater Bay Area, uh, those that still live in Hong Kong, that reside in Hong Kong, that are, that are serving still as the portal for foreign capital and investment into China, uh, that Hong Kong remains a very uh, you know, crucial and, and profitable place from which to uh, uh, invest in this area. Let's remember all the Greater Bay Area is the largest single mega city urban cluster in the entire world. It's much larger now than Tokyo uh, and a very you know, enormous GDP, a larger GDP in the Greater Bay Area than some G20 economies like Argentina, for example. So you know, that I, I don't want to put a positive spin on this. Okay, and finally, what do you see happen in the United States over the next few months? We've seen race riots, we've seen a lot of uh, tension. How does this uh, play itself out and what do you see happen in November and how does that impact what's happening between India and China at this moment in your view? Well, more broadly speaking, as you know, at this point, there's a lot of, uh, you know, frustration, uncertainty, um, you know, with the Trump administration and the fact that uh, obviously it's quite distracted. Uh, it's, it's much more focused on the election. And to the extent that foreign policy plays a role, it's largely symbolic and rhetorical. Right now, for example, the meme is to paint uh, Joe Biden as a China lover or something like that. So, uh, you know, it's not a serious foreign policy discussion that's going on in the context of the election. Many countries are simply saying, you know, there is no solid commitment with the U.S. on whatever the issues are, such as the removal of troops from Europe, the future of the troop presence in um, in Afghanistan, and obviously its support for, uh, for, for allies and friends in the Indo-Pacific. All of this has to wait until after the election to see how serious and, and, and long term these uh, commitments are going to be. Um, and I think that is that is pretty much uh, you know the extent of it. And I think that India, too, will have to wait and see. Just look at what the Trump administration has done on H-1B visas, uh, for example. Um, so I think that, you know, we'll have depending on the outcome of the election, uh, that's when countries will make perhaps, you know, final long term decisions about how they want, uh, you know, how seriously they want to be exposed uh, to U.S. politics moving forward in terms of the role that the U.S. plays in their economies and in their strategic uh, framing of the world. But well, we've had many Indian and American scholars uh, over the last several weeks here on India Today, but it's very interesting to see the freshness of 
the ideas that you've been able to bring forth are a completely unique perspective. So I thank you for having taken out time to join us at a time when there is a lot of anxiety and stress around what happens next between India and China and where this confrontation goes from here. Parak Khanna for taking out time and joining us on the news track. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, this is Rahul Kamal here. Hope you enjoyed this video. For the latest news and analysis, like and subscribe the India Today YouTube channel and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay updated.